Hey everybody, welcome to the DEF CON 864 meeting for February 2022. Was it 2021? That's over and done. We've, we've conquered 2021. All hail the victors. We all live. We did. So normally we go around at the beginning of a meeting, we do introductions and blah, blah, blah. However, we're starting a new series on anonymity and privacy online. And I am probably going to flummox saying anonymity at least five times during this presentation. Anonymity. Yeah, so uh, DEF CON 864 as a group is just a local group of technology. You can be any role of technology. You could even just be somebody that's interested in it but not necessarily directly tied to information security, pen testing, intrusion analysis, GRC, any of those things that we tend to think of with information security. You're more than welcome to be part of DEF CON 864 as a group. But we as a, as a group are also part of the Electronic Frontier Foundation's alliance. They're the primary privacy watchdogs, and so we look to them for a great deal of wisdom and insights, both from a legal perspective, as well as um, just help in normal everyday life. This series that we're going to start, it's basically going to be exploring different aspects and roles of privacy. Some months will be less technical than others. This month we're just doing a, a cursory level setting, laying of the land for what that looks like for, for online uh, browsing. So once we understand that as everybody, because we all have different experiences and backgrounds, so let's just get that out of the way, which is why the slide here is saying kind of all about Tor. We're not going to go into every nuance and aspect of about it this month. Uh, but in coming months, we will explore all the different things like relays and running services and things like that. The one thing we want to point out here, and I'm going to say it several times throughout this process, is that at no point of what, what we'll talk about, what I'll talk about in this meeting or any of the future meetings, is to communicate or convey any type of sketchy or illegal behavior that we're going to advocate online. That's just, that's not how we roll or operate as DEFCON 864. Uh, but we do understand that we as individual humans have certain inalienable rights, and we want to protect and preserve those and how we conduct ourselves online. Before I get started, I need to say a disclaimer, and that is everything that I'm about to say, apparently after this point, um, is, are my own thoughts, they're my own expressions, they're not those of my employer, either legally or through implication, my spouse, my family, my friends, any pets that I've owned or been friends with, uh, or any code that I have written in the past. So there, it's, it's all me here. And by saying that, I'm now pointing to a slide deck that I did not create from scratch. This was put together by the Tor project to help spread the word about what Tor is and help remove a lot of the myth and mysticism around, you know, you, you often hear the dark web and the deep web and, and Tor. We're going to look into what that is tonight from a, from a high level. So at, at, a, at a base perspective, when we talk about privacy and anonymity online, we need to first establish that some basic ground rules, and that is just be a good human. So that's one of the core tenets when you talk about a code of conduct for our meetings, right? You, we have a thing that's slide presentation that goes through a little bit, and it talks about some nice things. But the, the core part of it is to just be nice to other people. Be awesome, right? So everybody has privacy and freedom as a basic human right. But we live in a world that has tracking and surveillance that's widespread, both from a government perspective as well as just from advertising agencies and services that are offered for free and then collected behind the scenes and sold off to the highest bidders. One thing that comes up anytime you talk about using Tor or privacy or anonymity, and I don't know if you've heard this or not, I've heard it from at least half a dozen people, is, well, I don't have anything to hide, therefore I don't have anything I need to worry about. And that's really not what this discussion is about. It's not what we're addressing. By giving things away by default, we're living in a society where it's collected by default. It may set you up 10, 20 years from now where something that you searched, researched for an extended period of time comes back to bite you when that data is collected by your future insurance provider and now your rates go up and you really have no understanding as to why that is. Bottom line is people shouldn't be exploited for using the internet. So what is Tor? At a high level, it's just free software. It's open source software. And it's also an open network. It's a, it's a tunneled, encrypted network on the open public internet. It mitigates any risk that we have, and I say that with a qualifier, of being tracked and surveilled in our online activity, as well as a, a segment for censorship, which we're not really going to get into tonight uh, too much. But if you're in a country that censors internet activity, running and using Tor can help you get around that censorship. There's a caveat I want to point out here. I'm not advocating in any way, shape, or form that you download and install Tor on your work computer. 
on your school computers. Like that's a great way of getting an interview with. If your organization is mature enough, that's a great way of getting an interview with people you don't want to really be getting on the radar for. Right. So we want to be playing nice in that realm, but when it comes to us as individual people, we don't necessarily have the same protections that our corporation does in isolating their network from the public internet. Right. There's two parts of what is meant by Tor and the Tor Project. There is a U.S.-based nonprofit company called the Tor Project. And then they oversee the software that's released and put out. It was originally created and started by the U.S. Navy, but that's long since been turned over to this organization. The code is open source. We can all eat it, read through it, dissect it. Um, and each of us could run relays on the public Internet to basically build out that Tor network for everyone else to use. So it's run by us, common people. Pretty well understood that everything from the services that we use for email all the way up to the governments that are protecting us, and I'm air-quoting that extensively with, within my head. They're, they're all tracking us and keeping track of what we do. So surveillance threats come from many different locations, not necessarily just evil actors online. So there's two parts to this and, and how it completes out. You have the Tor browser, uh, which connects to the Tor network through a network daemon which if you're a Linux fan and you've been using Linux for a while, you're pretty familiar with daemons, but it's really just a computer program that runs almost as a service. And it presents a SOX or HTTP proxy. It defaults to SOX, but it has some fallbacks in it. Location and source anonymity. We get into this a little bit more in depth later on, but this is really important. Where you're searching from, your laptop, your PC, now gets hidden and isolated away when you use Tor, and is now sheltered through that Tor network. So what your traffic comes out the other side is now looking like it comes from the big nebulous cloud of Tor as opposed to your home ISP. And there's network relays in many parts of the world. I think the last count, it was over 6,000 relays around the world. Basically, there's a really uh, intricate process for how the data is encrypted. We often think of encrypting internet traffic with HTTPS, where we're just securing that transport layer to make sure that you know nobody's really listening in to us. But if you look in the top left, you have the onion, and Tor stands for the onion router. And so it takes your data that you want to search the internet for, and it wraps it in three layers of encryption using three different keys. And those keys are known by, and it's a Diffie-Hellman encryption, for those of you that want to geek out over that, those three layers are intended for three different nodes in the cloud of the Tor network. In order to get those keys and know how to do that encryption, the Tor browser first queries a directory server, similar to DNS. It gets that listing of what it's going to use, and it picks three random nodes, three random relays in that connection, and then builds your packet uh, to go through that. And as, as it passes through each one of those relays, the encryption layer is stripped off, passed to the next one, stripped off. And then when it hits that third relay, that's called an exit node or an exit relay. And that final layer of Tor encryption is pulled off, and it's now just HTTPS going out over the public internet to your destination. So anything in that Tor relay scenario, that Tor cloud there, that Tor bubble, doesn't know what your data is. It doesn't have access to that. At most, it knows the, the relay or your source before it and the one after it. That's all it knows. It just knows source and destination in those places. So to look at that in depth, if we, if we take a look at our standard use of the internet today, um, with, when we don't use HTTPS and we don't use Tor, everything, like even if you have a hacker sitting on your, your local network, they're watching your traffic. So if you can, if you notice in the top left, you've got this person sitting in a laptop and it has, uh, it says site.com, user password, data, and location. That's all the data elements that could be collected for a fingerprint that would identify that individual uniquely on the public internet. And by default, when you send that over the wire, Everybody in the food chain, from your ISP, everybody that they want to sell that data off to, um, to the intelligence services that are working with those ISPs to monitor that traffic, um, is all that all those people have access to that information and that data, and it flows all the way down to the site that, that's getting it and passed over. Now you can see if we move over to the next slide. Um, who can see your data and activity with Tor and HTTPS enabled? And you'll notice that the bubbles for each of the players in between you, the source, and your destination at the end, that site.com, all of a sudden those data values start to disappear and they get blanked out. They can piece together like individual aspects of that data, um, but they, they can't put together the full picture. And most of these marketing companies, advertising agencies, what, 
what they're hoping to do when they're gathering up all this collected information is find unique ways to identify your unique fingerprint on the internet. Everything from the resolution to display of your monitor, like all kinds of unique things that they can do. There's there, like in the last week there was a new fingerprinting method that was just published out. Oh, and I'm going to draw a blank on what the name of it was, but it uses your GPU and, and uh, JavaScript right to calculate a, a unique fingerprint ID, even if you have the exact same graphics card. Like if we had the exact same graphic card, we have two unique fingerprints as a result of that calculation. So that's a new one to watch out for. But in this scenario here, what we've done is we're basically just tunneling all of our data. And, and shuttling it across the Tor network and isolating away from all of those people's eyes. And this is typically where somebody would throw out the statement of, well, I don't really have anything to hide, so I don't necessarily care if they monitor that. But you're assuming that all those people between you and that site are altruistic or transparent in what they're doing with your data. That they don't have any other purpose for using you uniquely to fit some other means. Like, it's not a two-way street here. It's not an equal anonymity scenario. Each of those watchers between the ISPs, as well as the companies that they sell off to in their collections, they're not up front and public about anything that they're doing. If it wasn't for watchdogs, if it wasn't for whistleblowers, we the people wouldn't necessarily know some of the services that are collecting the data on us. So it's not a fair game, right? They want us to be fully transparent online. But they're not necessarily being fully transparent with us. So when we look at the Tor network, I mentioned that it blocks fingerprinting. And there's just a few examples on here where it hides some of that information about us. So for example, in the lower left, it talks about cross-site correlation. If you have two tabs, the Tor browser does an excellent job, better than any other browser, of isolating what communication can take place for the identification of you doing that browsing between those two tabs. Fully isolated off, right? The comment at the bottom where it says writes nothing to disk, I don't necessarily agree with that. It does write trace information to the disk, but we'll cover in, a, in a next month um, how to get around that to where you can have an amnesic-based web presence, and we'll get a little bit into the complexities of what it takes to truly be invisible. All right, so th this is the start page for Tor. When you first load Tor on your system, let's say that you're... You're, you're, you have a standard Windows laptop or a Mac, and you're going to install and load the Tor browser. You're OK with using it for research. And this is how I normally use it. I, I like using it as my default browser. It, it, in, it defaults to have two plugins enabled by default. That is no script and HTTPS everywhere. So if any site tries, tries to downgrade you to HTTP, uh, it's, that's getting forced up to HTTPS. If a site tries to load a bunch of JavaScript and reference other sites to load their JavaScript. I mean, potentially that's a supply chain attack, right? But on this base site here, what we're looking at is it says connect to Tor, and you have two options. Well, a couple options, right? You have, you can look at the settings, which we always do as security professionals. The first thing we do is look at our settings to make sure that they meet our operational security needs, and then we connect to some network here. You can flag the box for always connect automatically. This is if you didn't necessarily want to always be on Tor when you fired up the Tor browser. If I open up the Tor settings, you'll notice that, and this is a build of Firefox, by the way. So if you're used to using Firefox, it's the exact same. You just gain some extra parameters and settings under this Tor setting here. Uh, the one that is of most interest to you, if you go under the security and privacy setting, uh, there's a couple things that I recommend to do. The first is to, <clears throat> for whatever reason, they don't have these disabled by default, like location, camera, and otherwise. You have to enable block new uh, requests if you wanted to have that in there. So normally when I'm doing my research, I, I don't like anything like popping up or asking for any of that. And then at the very bottom, uh, by default, it runs in standard mode. That will allow JavaScript and other things to run. It's uh, dangerous in that regard. You can go to the safer, safer object option, but if, if you want to be the most efficient in your research, if you're just really down to read and study information, going into safest strips away a lot of the distractions. I have this set on safest right now. Let's go back over and connect to the Tor network. All right, so we're establishing a connection. You'll notice that it is slower. And that's expected, right? I mean, you're basically doing now three times the level of transport encryption that you would normally be doing over HTTPS. But up here at the top, we have our friend, the padlock icon. But when we click on it, we get a lot more information than we normally do with just a certificate. So this shows the circuit that it built for us and how we're navigating around the world in order to reach the DC864.org website. In this case, 
Uh, we're going through the Netherlands, Norway, and Austria. One of the things I want to point out is not all relays are created equal. Some of them actually have special status that we want to highlight, and we are going to go into depth in the, in the coming sessions on these. Uh, as we look over this first one, the guard relay, you'll see that one stay with you for a longer period of time, where like every 10, 20 minutes or so, you'll, if you check your circuit, you'll notice that these other two are changing out to something different. So your route through that is never, data isn't passing through the same relays all the time. The longer you surf the web with Tor, the more routes your traffic is going to take to your destinations. So downloading the browser, you can go to the Tor project site to download it. Uh, if it's being blocked or you're having difficulty accessing the Tor project site, and let's just say they're undergoing a DDoS for whatever reason, our friends at the EFF as well as uh, the Calix Institute, they host official mirrors of the software. You can use GPG to validate the package, so you're just not installing untrusted software, which I greatly appreciate. Some co some companies will just give you like a hash, like a SHA-256, and that's fine. By default, the search engine in Tor is not Google. There are other search engines in the world that are out there, and uh, one of those is DuckDuckGo or DDG, and I already talked about how it's, in, it's packaged together with no script or HTTPS anywhere. Keep yourself from installing other plugins or extensions into the Tor browser. It says Flash here, but everybody at this point knows that Flash is a bad idea and we probably should have killed it soon after it was released. Um, best practice is just use it as, as vanilla and straight as possible with maybe making some of your OPSEC changes in the settings. But other than that, just keep it as vanilla as possible. So this is an example of no script for those of you that haven't used no script or aren't familiar with it. In the top left of your address, or top right of your address bar, you would see a pop-up that would indicate the number of, of sites that are requesting to run JavaScript in that browser section. So you'll see that number tally up. So in the case of the first item up here, it would just be one. And so if you click that item to come down, we never want to use the global whitelisting approvals for JavaScript. We always want to use the temporary approvals for, for JavaScript within Tor Browser. And the reason why is the more you customize and change it, the more you're basically creating an identifier of who you are in that browser session, right? And that's the same reason why to not install extensions as well, right. because those things are used to it. You want to stay exactly. as plain as possible. Exactly. So, and if we are whitelisting these sites to run JavaScript in our browser, and then like I talked about, they get supply chain breached. Now we've whitelisted and authorized that site as a trusted site, and now they're just running any JavaScript they want as well. And the same thing with extensions. The uh, DuckDuckGo, that is, is that actually a good uh, browser? That is a real that protects your data? It is a good search engine. It is not as thorough as Google, and we can go into maybe how that algorithm works. It's intentionally a bit different than Google. Now, what I'm showing on the screen here as well, DuckDuckGo claims that they don't track you, which is a big win. We want to see those kind of confirmations from companies that we utilize. But at the same time, it's nice to have a browser that's enforcing that for us, right? Even if there's maybe like a leadership change, <coughs> Twitter, you know, or something that happens behind the scene where oh no, we question what's going on there. At least, you know, we're doing our part to make sure that, that we're secure there. So Onion services and websites have a unique string at the beginning, and they're not user-friendly. It's not like a DNS resolvable name that's super friendly and easy to use. But they always end in a dot .onion, and that's the addressable space within the Onion network and the Onion router. One last comment. So I've spoken a lot about using Tor with a, with a laptop, a PC, more of a physical endpoint that's more substantial, right? There are options and services when it comes to your mobile devices, but because of the inherent insecure nature of mobile devices, they ins they're designed to give away an identity, to have an explicit identity associated with them. Even if you're using burner phones, your ability to abstract yourself from that is very limited. So recommendations, if you're looking for them, yes, there's Orbot for Android, there's some services like that. Those are fine, but just realize from an operational security standpoint, it's nowhere close to the same as running it on what you see here now. They're very different. And there's a ton of them in the, the Apple Store. None of them are valid. None of them are legitimate. So like, basically, if you have iOS, just if you see Tor in the, in the store, just know it's not from the Tor project. You know, skip, skip that altogether. You know? Save your research or something else uh, for later on. And the last thing I want to leave you with is when it, this isn't just for security researchers. You know, I think about my family. Um, who are maybe older, and some of them are doing research on health issues and stuff like that, 
and they are constantly getting phone calls about or or advertisements that are you know basically like the old school pop-ups right advertisements in their search history based on the problems that they're feeling that are very personal with their life share this with your family and friends not just because the more people using Tor creates a broader pool for that you know all of us to hide in but it helps prevent them from being exploited uh, online as well that's all I have for this week this month you don't want to change the size of the browser that's right yep so it opens to a default size and you want to kind of leave it that way they you're, that's a great point they've calculated that to be the most standard and average across the general populace uh, yeah we'll turn if there's no other questions we can do that yeah yeah I got a question I had questions about Tor, but I'll save it for next week. Okay. Like, should we be using Tor for, like, normal browsers? Like, should, it, should it replace Chrome? It, de it depends. Like, that's an individual choice up to you. I advocate, yes, I think it should as a default browser. I personally am moving further and further away from Chrome, partly due to the organization that owns and controls that code, even though Chromium underneath has now populated everything down to Edge. And that's not... And the fact that it's uh, also very heavily... It, it uses too much RAM... But you want to be careful with what you do inside the Tor browser, because if you go to an account and log in, that service is still knowing who you are. You've, you've just yes. given up any kind of anonymity by logging into a service. And what they, what they know about you is they know that you're a Tor user, which is fine to a degree, because you're still not giving away your individual. Like right now, if I were to disconnect from Tor and log into like a Gmail account, they would know end to end a lot of details about my asset and my account that I logged in with, whereas if you connect to Tor and you create a brand new like Proton Mail account and you only ever access that Proton Mail account through Tor, like, that's pretty good OPSEC. The challenge becomes the minutia, the metadata, and did you one time maximize the screen? Yep. Uh, were you logged into other tabs and other services and was any of thing being scraped? I mean, yep. designed not to, right, but the reality is, is those, those types, types of things, things do happen, and it's, and it's just, just a trail. trail. So, so from, from like an OPSEC plan, like I intentionally use this browser just when I want to have that level of anonymity, and then I use other browser choices for day to day with still a conscious effort to knowing that you know I'm being tracked. They know who I am. They know what I'm doing. I still use Firefox with no script and HTTPS everywhere, even though it's not Tor. But it's kind of, I kind of think of it as Tor light in a way. Do you, do you mind going back to the slide that had the traffic routed? Yeah, I think that's an excellent way of explaining that threat model too. Like if I'm logging in with my bank, all of those people already have that information to Tor relays. I'm going to use Firefox. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, like all those people on the side already have bank account information as needed. But if I'm trying to do the security research, then they don't need to know that. I'm going to go to Tor yep. and boot that up. Next month, I'd like to talk in depth and show Tails versus Cubes versus Hunix. And personally, depending on the type of research that I'm really diving into, I, I loved Cubes. I ran Cubes, bare metal, for a year. And what I liked about it was it's, it's really contained every single app and page that's opening up is isolated in its own sandbox and it detonates and can't go anywhere else or do anything. It's really slick. And we've talked about it before in previous meetings like back in 2019, but I think doing this as a series and really just kind of stepping through logically how it all flows and connects together I think would be helpful. So maybe next month we'll do the abstraction. We looked at a browser, then we'll look at isolating your, your OS, and then we'll move into the network, uh, the Tor network. Any thoughts about running Tor, your first hop through a VPN? Before, before you, you hit the Tor, Tor network, network directly, directly from a browser. Because, because when you hit the Tor network, your ISP still sees it. Yep. Or, or sees, sees that you are reaching out to that network. network. They, 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 of course, can't see your tunnel traffic. They actually have, and I forget, I'm going to own that I forget. That is on their FAQ. So they talk about VPN before Tor and VPN after Tor, or Tor plus VPN, where you're, because that first and last leg are basically sitting in a little bit more of an exposed state, definitely an exposed state, right? And I can't remember, I think they advocated against it, but I can't remember which one it was. One was okay, one was not. So the, the, the rough plan, the idea, and I'm not trying to commit you to anything, but the rough plan is we'll walk through this week looking at the browser, running the OS, 
running a re running your own relays, your own entry node, your own mid guards, your own middle server. Not your so guard is the first one. Middle server and exit nodes. You never run an exit node from your house ever, 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 ever. ever. Um, and then we'll look at actually running a service on the other end of it. And if if all goes well, knock on wood, fingers crossed, we're gonna um, put the plan together and publish how to build your own tour. Network in like our workstation or virtual box with your own service on the other end that you can control and play with. So that's you know given time if we can work it out, we're playing around with how that can look. That's, that's the plan. So you could host your own service on the Tor network and access it on a Raspberry Pi naturally. Yeah, of course. Not from your house. <laughs> your, your house, not my house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah but neighbor's Wi-Fi for that. And there's, and there's two services, services we're looking into that. There is actually a share, an Onion Share service that we're going to stand up that's, that you can do. It has a really cool feature. Um, and I know I'm going to be trying to give spoilers right now. But it's kind of like Box.com or Dropbox. And one of the options you can set when you put a file in there is stop sharing as soon as it's downloaded the first time. And so you get an immediate log entry that so-and-so downloaded this. Sharing is disabled at this point. Pretty slick. And then maybe run it as a run your mud client through it. Mud game. Mud game. Yeah. I'll do my research. I don't know of any. So mud is multi dungeon. I don't know of any muds that are hosted and available on Onion. So if you get it working, you're going to have to update your web page. I totally will. I mean, I think we are one of the oldest running muds still out there. So, so we've been up to like 93. So, so we're they were on, on the two, two in the bedroom, right? So. Yeah. yeah. If there's no other questions, I'm going to stop recording.